this morning we're starting a brand new summer sermon series uh, titled Day Like Paul. Day Like Paul. So in the months of July and August, uh, we're going to be taking time to look together at what it means to pray like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Uh, through this series, uh, we're thinking about a number of different subjects as we look at Paul's prayers. So we're going to be thinking about the subjects of presence, uh, thanksgiving, love, uh, knowledge, expectation, power, intercession, and petition. So that's the kind of plan over the next uh, nine weeks or so. Um, that's what we're thinking about. Uh, this morning, what we're doing is taking time to look together at what it means for you and I to pray with hope. To pray with hope. Um, let's take some time to look together at what are two of Paul's prayers in Romans chapter 15. So if you have, have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans 15. We're going to begin by looking at verses 5 to 6. I'm reading from the CSB, Christian Standard Bible. The words are going to be up on the screen as well. Uh, so Paul says in Romans uh, 15, starting in verse 5 and through to 6. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Amen. And then if you jump just a few verses later to verse 13, verse 13 in Romans 15, the Apostle Paul, Paul prays this to the church in Rome. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's just take a moment to pray. So Father, we recognise that this is your word. And we pray that as we have taken time to read your word, and as we take time to study and apply your word, that you would speak, you would speak through me, that you would anoint my words, but you would also anoint, anoint each one of our ears. And we would choose to respond in faith to what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, as we begin this series, uh, we're thinking about the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And as we take time to examine the verses we've just read, uh, I want us to begin by asking this question. Uh, why, is it, why is it that we should pray like the Apostle Paul? Why should we pray like the Apostle Paul? In other words, what, what do we mean when we say, and when we exhort this title, pray like Paul, what are we getting at when we say that? It's an important question to ask because it's the premise of the entire series over the next nine weeks. And I know I'm probably biased and I say this a lot, but I'm really excited about what we're going to be looking at over the next nine weeks as we think about all these different ways in which Paul prays. And I'm excited because I believe that we should pray like Paul. We should pray like Paul. And tying in with that, I'm also excited for how God's going to speak to us directly within our lives. I'm excited for how it is that God's going to challenge us. And he will challenge us through his word. He always challenges us. The question is, are we open and attentive to how he might challenge? I'm excited for how it is God's going to shape us through his word. And as we respond to his word, may we be a people who really do pray like Paul. I've still not answered the question. Um, but why should we pray like the Apostle Paul. Why should we pray like the Apostle Paul? Well, when we say pray like Paul, we're not saying that Paul is the only person that we ought to pray like in the Scriptures. That's not what we're saying. Like there are no other examples of individuals within Scripture that really help us to understand what it means to pray in a biblical way. And we're not saying that Paul is in some way better or more authoritative than other New Testament writers when it comes to what he prays and how he prays, nor are we saying that we've not really prayed unless our prayers are like Paul. We're not saying that either. Like we have to sound exactly like Paul in order for genuine prayer to take place. What we're saying this morning is that the subject of prayer in Scripture is almost like a vast land with a number of different reservoirs. And we can come and we can take water from a number of these different sources to give you a few examples, we can quench our spiritual thirst from the Psalms, or the Psalms for you guys, <laughs> uh, or from the prayer life of Jesus, uh, from the prayers we find in the book of Acts, the early church, from the prayers of Abraham, Moses, the prayers we find amongst the Old Testament prophets, and from so many others, including 
the prayer life of the Apostle Paul. This last one is the particular reservoir that we're going to focus on in the next nine weeks. July and August 2022 is therefore an invitation for you and I to come with an empty bucket, ready to fill that water, that bucket with, with spiritual water, so that we can be strengthened and equipped for all that God might call us to do this year. And it's not just that we should solely take this water, we also need to drink this water. We need to receive this water in our hearts. We need to drink in what it is the Apostle Paul says through his own personal prayer life as he sought to pray for different individuals and churches throughout the New Testament. And we drink in how it is the Apostle Paul prays by walking in the way of his own personal prayer life. Because in as many words, Paul actually says this. Paul, Paul commands us to do this in the New Testament. God's word commands us, First, First Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, through the Apostle Paul, Paul says this, Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Paul says it. Imitate me, First Corinthians 4, 16. He's not just talking to the Corinthians. He's talking to every single one of us here today. Paul calls us to imitate him. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul again says this, Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. So 1 Corinthians 4, imitate me. 1 Corinthians 11, he's making that same point again. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And in Philippians 3, and verse 17, Paul reinforces this. He says, Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. Paul wants us to recognise the importance of, the necessity of copying, reflecting his way of life. So confident Paul was in his walk with the Lord that he could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I know I couldn't say that to any one of you today, and I know none of us could either, but Paul had such a closeness and nearness with God that he could say, imitate me, as I imitate Christ, including through his prayer life. So we can say with confidence this morning, to pray like Paul is in fact to pray biblically. It's to pray as Jesus would pray. As Paul imitates Christ, we imitate Paul. What an exciting privilege for us this morning. What a great opportunity you have this summer. What an amazing calling that stands before you this summer, to pray like Paul, to look at Paul's prayers and to pray like Paul, like the Apostle Paul. There's always a danger when it comes to Paul. We can get so caught up with the personality of Paul, Paul the man, that we forget something really important. We forget that when Paul writes, it's God. God is writing through Paul. So we can say that when Paul prays certain prayers, this is the word of the Lord and God is speaking through Paul as he prays. Get your head around that. Paul is praying to God and yet God is working in Paul to pray to him. Therefore, to pray like Paul is to pray as God has called us to pray because, because why? All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3 and verses 16 to 17. Now, prayer at its foundational level is us meeting with God. That's, that's the essence of prayer. We meet with God and we invite God into our present day situations. Our heart, our soul longs for God and we want to connect with him. This is what prayer is. This is the essence of of a healthy prayer life. And as we invite him in, we worship him, we thank him, we ask him for forgiveness, we seek his help in the midst of all that we face, we pray for strength, that we can be everything that he calls us to be, that we can be effective, faithful and fruitful for him. This is prayer. We pray all different kinds of requests, but ultimately at the very heart of every prayer is us wanting to meet with God and connect with him. Our heart's desire is that we would know God in a better way, as God knows us perfectly. And us doing that is only ever possible through the work of the Holy Spirit. 
the Spirit of God who dwells within us. If we have faith in Christ today, where we can say that God's Spirit, God himself dwells within us. And that's really important. The Holy Spirit plays the crucial role in leading us as we pray, cleansing us as we pray, empowering us as we pray. Prayer is not, it's not this kind of distant transaction. God is up here and we are down here and we are praying to God and asking for certain things. No, prayer is in here. God is in our lives. God is at work in our hearts. And God is in here. We have the mind of Christ. So God will direct our prayers as we meditate upon his word and as we are sensitive to his spirit. So we are transformed from the inside out. We have the mind of Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, we have absolutely everything we need for an effective and fruitful prayer life. We are fully resourced to pray in a manner that's worthy of God that brings glory to his name. And I think, I'm guessing, but I do think we often miss this. We forget the role of the Holy Spirit when it comes to our prayer life. We often think, you know, we mess up in various ways. We fall short in so many ways. And sometimes we, we don't feel we're worthy to stand before God and ask for him to step in. But the reality is we are worthy because of Christ. We are in Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. We can come before this throne of grace with boldness and confidence and ask that he would provide in our moment of need. And that is so important when it comes to prayer. Uh, Ten years ago, almost to the day, I was at St Andrews and I was at my first ever Scottish Baptist Ministers Conference. Uh, the only problem as I made my debut to this conference was I wasn't a minister. I wasn't a minister yet. Uh, I was a minister in training. I managed to kind of gate crash, sneak in, blag my way into this. <laughs> um, someone put a word in for me to attend. Uh, one of the primary reasons for wanting to go to this conference was Don Carson, who's coming to share. Uh, and there was about 60 or 70 ministers, and Don Carson was there, and he was just pouring his wisdom into our lives. Don Carson's a, a famous, a well-known Christian author and pastor. The issue I had 10 years ago, I looked about 16 or 17. So people are probably wondering, who's this boy that's just turned up? Um, but I didn't care. I was there to hear the dawn. Um, and each session, I would be sitting right in the front row, right in the middle, just soaking in all that he had to share. And it was, it was a great conference. The one thing I remember from all that he shared as he unpacked the book of Ephesians, over two days, two consecutive days. Something we're actually going to look at later on, mid-August, Ephesians chapter 3. But I always remember from what his teaching uh, was, he, he unpacked Ephesians. And he began at the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 1. And he would read a section of Ephesians 1. And then he would stop. And then he would look at all the ministers and say, when was the last time you prayed like that? could hear a pin drop and then he'd move on to the next section read that he would stop he would look up and say when was the last time you prayed like that and he kept going and going and going he kept reading and stopping and challenging he kept reading stopping challenging all the way through to Ephesians chapter 3 and I was so impacted by that I was so conscious of my shopping list prayers God Help me with this and this and this. And that's okay from time to time to do that, to ask God for help in the midst of the particular circumstances we face. But we need to begin with biblical prayer, with prayers that are fueled by his spirit and give us the correct perspective when it comes to, to living for him. His main point, the Don's main point, personal terms now, close friends, you know, no kidding. His main point was this, are the prayers of Paul a reflection of your prayer life? Do you pray like Paul, and if not, why not? The question remains for each one of us this morning. When you pray, does it look like, does it feel like, does it sound like you've jumped out of the New Testament? Or do you pray more like a Baptist, or a Scot, or even worse, a Scottish Baptist? <laughs> or whatever nationality or denomination you're from. My hope for each one of us is that you and I would find ourselves 
praying as Paul prays in the New Testament, including his prayer for us in Romans 15, verse 5 to 6, and verse 13. Denison Baptist Church, everyone else who is here, when was the last time you prayed like this? Verse 5. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. When was the last time you prayed like that? Denison Baptist Church, everyone else who is here, when was the last time you prayed like this? Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when you examine these prayers, these two prayers of Paul in Romans 15, when you really focus in on what he says, what he prays, it becomes clear that these, these are prayers that we can pray for each other. So we can pray these prayers to each other, vocally or internally. But we can also pray these prayers for ourselves. So you could pray something to the effect of this. God, as the one who gives endurance and encouragement, I pray that this person, insert name here, so whoever you're praying for, I pray that this person is able to live in harmony with other people within the life of the church. And God, I pray that through that, they would be able to glorify God the Father with one mind and one voice. We can pray that kind of prayer. Or you can make it personal. You could pray this. God is a God of all hope. I ask that you would fill me with all joy and peace as I believe, so that I may over, overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can pray like that. You can do that. Paul prays like that. Paul calls us to imitate him. So why aren't we doing that? As we think about praying like Paul, it really is as simple as that. Take the prayers of Paul, apply them directly to your life, and watch how God works in your life. Because we're praying scripture. And there's nothing more important than praying scripture. And watch how God transforms your heart and your mind Watch how you experience more of God in your life. You will know his nearness. You will know his intimacy. He will direct your prayers in your moment of need as you stand in the foundation of God's word. You know, I loved our 24-hour prayer time during the week. We had a 24-hour prayer time Tuesday through to Wednesday. And it never ceases to amaze me how powerful these times are. Um, I walked into that space feeling heavy, feeling burdened, overwhelmed. And when it came to my time to finish, I almost wanted to lock the door and not let anyone else in. I wanted to stay in the space and spend more time in prayer. I've spoken to a number of you this week and you've testified to the exact same thing. You felt heavy and burdened. You walked away light. You wanted to stay for longer. The hour went like that. So often happens. You went from feeling burdened to feeling carried, from feeling downhearted to uplifted from feeling hopeless to hopeful. When we come before God, like many of us have done this week, when we permit him to work in our lives, we cannot help but pray with hope. We cannot help but pray in line with what it is Paul prays in Romans 15 and verses 5 to 6 and in verse 13. So what we're going to do is just take a moment to study these two prayers. And as we study these prayers, there are three things I want to share which I believe will help us come to terms with what it means to pray like Paul, to pray with hope, to pray with hope. And the first point I want us us to see from these prayers is this. Number one, uh, we pray with hope in light of what God has done. We pray with hope in light of what God has done. And this first point, it might seem strange to you. We're speaking about what God has done, past tense, as a reason for our hope. John Stott says that hope is always looking to the future. And that's absolutely true. We're always looking ahead when we carry hope. And the reason we can be hopeful in the future is because of what's happened in the past. That's the reality. The reality of the past means we we can look ahead. We can look forward. We can have hope. God has been consistent. God will be consistent. To illustrate this point, let's just read verse 13 again. The Apostle Paul prays like this. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in his prayer, 
Paul refers to God as a God of hope. Don't miss that. Paul refers, Paul prays to God as a God of hope. In other words, we pray to God, we pray to the one who is the author of hope. Hope was and hope is and hope always will be God's idea because God invented hope. God is not just the author of hope. He is the object of our hope. It's why we we just sang, and I had no idea you guys were going to sing this. I had this in my notes already. It's why we sang, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. He's the object of our hope. We look to Jesus and we say, he is my hope. He's my hope. If he's not your hope, you don't know him. And so why is God, as Paul prays here, the God of hope? Why is he the author of hope? Why is he the object of our hope? Well, he is all of us because of what he in Christ has already done for us past tense. What's God done for us? Well, he created us. He created us with different personalities and different gifts, different abilities, different circumstances. And yet we chose to reject him. We turned our back on him. We declared independence from God and we decided to go our own way and to do our own thing. We rejected God and yet God pursued us. God loved us. God forgave us when we came to him asking for his love and for his grace in light of his sin that we carried. And God forgave us by sending his son Jesus. Jesus lived amongst us. Jesus died for us on the cross and Jesus rose from the dead. And through Jesus, we have hope. No question about it. What God has done for us enables you and I to pray to the God of all hope because Jesus has went so far to bring us back into this right relationship so that if we believe in him, we will not perish but have eternal life and we will receive this, this amazing gift of hope, the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which is a down payment for this eternity with God. Peter writes something similar in 1 Peter 1 and in verse 3. And these are well-known words. He points to the past as a reason for our hope for the future. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into, into what? A living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the living hope that you and I have today stands in the foundation of the gospel. The fact that Jesus has rescued us from our sins and brought us back into a relationship with him. So we have a living hope today. We can look ahead with hope because of what Christ has done for us. Amen. Amen. So I wonder this morning, are you feeling hopeless? Are you feeling hopeless? If you are feeling hopeless today, have you ever spent time meditating, reflecting on, thinking about what God has done for you in Christ? Have you spent time unpacking why it is the God of hope is called the God of hope? Because of past, because of what he has done for you. Most importantly of all, have you prayed? Have you prayed and asked God that the gospel would become more and more real to your life? So it's not just this understanding of different facts about God, but it's something that that waterfalls into your heart, something that you experience in your life. So that you know with all that you are, that your hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And you can step forward today in faith, knowing that God has your back. The cross is sufficient. The resurrection actually happened. It's a historical fact. I can promise you this morning, that if you're feeling hopeless today and you do that, you pray and ask for the gospel to become real in your life, you'll experience hope. In fact, as Paul prays, you'll overflow with hope. You'll overflow with hope. That doesn't mean you'll have a a little bit of hope in your life. You'll overflow. Abundant hope. Abundant hope. So we don't just pray with hope. In light of what God has done, we also, number two, pray with hope in the middle of what God is doing. In the middle of what God is doing. So take hold of this gospel reality. And from that foundation, let's look at point number two. We pray with hope in the middle of what God is doing. 
to understand what we mean by that, let's just take some time to look together at verses 5 to 6. And this is the first prayer of Paul in this chapter. Paul prays this. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Now notice that the word hope is not in this prayer. Some of you may have noticed that already. Paul doesn't say anything, or Paul doesn't pray anything about hope in verses 5 to 6. But check out the context of our passage. Have a look at what Paul says in verses 1 to 2. We'll start with verses 1 to 2, and then we'll move on to verse 3 and 4. Verse 1, Paul says this, Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbour for his good, to build him up. So what's Paul, what's Paul getting at here? Well, to be a Christian, to be Christian by definition, it's not about pleasing yourself. We can so often forget that. We think that Christian life is about pleasing me, myself and I. But Paul says here, it's not about that. It's not about pleasing yourself. It's not about doing what you want to do. It's about dying to self. It's about taking up your cross it's about recognising there's something more important than your particular desire. To be a Christian is not about pleasing yourself. And Paul continues on in verse 3. Look at how he brings us all back to the example of Jesus. So Paul's not just saying this. He roots it in the example of Christ. Verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. In other words, what Paul is saying here is the example of Jesus in the scriptures was for our benefit, so that we might endure, so that we might be encouraged, and this in turn would bring about what? This in turn would bring about hope within our lives. When we look at the example of Christ, it causes us to endure, to be encouraged, to not think about ourselves, but to think about other people. And this leads to hope. And look at what this results in. Paul's prayer in verse 5 to 6. Let me just read it again. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. So Christ's example at the top enables us to endure and be encouraged. This brings about hope in our lives. This causes unity within the church. We can't manufacture unity within the church. It all starts from Christ's example. And this is the pattern that Paul's following. Does that make sense? So when you and I draw near to God, he's changing. He's changing each one of us, not just us individually. He's changing us collectively. So when we draw near to God, we become more like Jesus within ourselves. But when we do that, when we draw near to God, we also become one as a church family. He's changing us personally, but he's changing us collectively as a family. So no doubt, this will cause us to have hope. When you see God change you, when you see unity within the life of the church, you can't help but see hope in the midst of that. To give you an example, uh, Last month, six weeks ago, probably two months ago maybe, uh, we prayed for Salah. I'm going to stop there, it wasn't three months. We prayed for Salah um, and we were praying. What was our prayer for Salah? He was going through the mill. He was going through a really difficult time. We prayed, God, would you give us brother of ours short-term accommodation in Glasgow? Salah was destined to, to move to Newcastle. Every government official was saying to Salah, you're definitely going to Newcastle. That was that was a promise from the government. The government doesn't promise a lot, but it promised that. And it was incredible. It was mind blowing. As we prayed, we said, "No, we, we do not want this to happen." Salah is as part of our family. We want him to stay here, and so we prayed. Salah prayed. We prayed together. We asked God, "Would you allow Salah to stay in Glasgow?" And every Every aid worker, charity worker I spoke to in Glasgow said it would be very, very difficult. Some said it would be impossible for Salah to find accommodation in Glasgow. And at the very last minute, 
the taxi driver who was picking Sal up to go to Newcastle said there's been a change of plan. He's not going to Newcastle, he's going to Glasgow. Praise God. Transformation. Sal, I was, he took off his top and started dancing in my kitchen. <laughs> giving it loudly. James was like, what's going on here? And no doubt about it, what happened in that moment instilled hope it instilled hope for Salah, but it also instilled hope for each one of us because we saw how God answered prayer. For your own life, when you see God at work in the midst of the challenges and the sufferings of your life, let the Holy Spirit enable you to endure. Let the Spirit encourage you so that you pray with hope, with full expectation that God's going to help you now and that God's going to help you in the future. See, I'm more confident now in my prayer life because of what happened with Salah. And well, God, if you can help Salah in that impossible situation, and it's always that thing, when in the moment you're like, there's no way this is going to change. And then when it does change, I'm so guilty of doing this. I say, it was going to happen anyway. <laughs> and that's so wrong. So wrong. God did what many might say a miracle in that moment. I still remember Salah getting a taxi from our house during missional community to his hotel in Glasgow, with a big smile on his face, waving away. Never seen someone so happy going into a Glasgow taxi. <laughs> so we should be encouraged, we should have hope. Have a look at what Paul writes earlier on in this letter, in Romans 5, and verses 3 to 5, he writes this. Not only that, it'll be up on the screen for us as well, but we, bo we also boast in our afflictions, because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character. Proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So I can be hopeful today. I can pray with hope. You can be hopeful today. You can pray with hope because we see what God is doing in our lives right now. We see how God is answering prayer. I hope, I hope you can say, as I've said, as you see God at work in your life, may it instill hope. As you look to the future, may you be confident. So that's the second point. In the midst of what God is doing, number three, we pray with hope in anticipation of what God will do. So take a look at verse 13. We're going to look at verse 13 again. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that word now, is so important, probably the most important word within that verse because it connects what Paul prays in verse 13 with what he, what he says in verse 7 and seven through to 12. In other words, the reason why I'm praying that the God of hope might fill you and cause you to overflow with hope is because of what I'm sharing in verses 7 to 12. This is what Paul is essentially saying. Verse 7 to 12, making some key points here. In light of verse 7 to 12, now may the God of hope are connected. Take a look at what Paul says then in verses 7 to 12. He writes this, Therefore welcome one another just as Christ also welcomed you to the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the fathers and so that Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing praise to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will appear, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. The Gentiles will hope in him. This is a fascinating quotation from Paul, taken from the Old Testament. And he's quoting four different Old Testament authors in this short segment. David, Moses, the psalmist, and the prophet Isaiah. And in each quotation, the, em the emphasis is on the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And he's speaking about their worship to God. So he says, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. And then he says, I will praise you among the Gentiles. Again, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. The one who rises to rule the Gentiles. The Gentiles will hope in him. So Gentiles, 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 Gentiles. What's Paul doing here? Well, he's looking ahead 
Paul's looking ahead, and he's looking ahead to that day when every tribe and every tongue will confess, will confess Jesus as Lord. It's a day when Jesus' command to make disciples of all nations will be fulfilled, the Great Commission. There's going to be a day when that command has been fulfilled through the mission of the church to a lost and hurting world. So Paul is saying here, my prayer is that you would look ahead to that day. You would look ahead to that day. The God of all hope would fill you, would cause you to overflow with hope, which in turn would cause you to be a man or woman who prays with hope. And you would look ahead to that day when every tribe and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord. This would be the fuel for your hope. This is what Paul's saying. So let it be the case, brothers and sisters, that we would hope in anticipation of what God's going to do. Every single tribe and tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. He's going to bring all peoples together. One day we're going to be in eternity. And I'm going to recognize all you guys and so many others. And we're all going to be worshiping together with every single nationality. Standing before a throne. Praising Jesus. To use a Scottish term, giving it loudly with all that we are. Recognizing that he is Lord. Can't really get my head around what it's going to look like, but it's going to be incredible. And what's even more incredible, or, or maybe just, just as incredible for me, is we get to play our part in that. So when we look ahead to that day, we get to play our part in that journey towards that day of salvation. This coming week, as far as I'm aware, God might do something else, but we have over 20 different nationalities coming to this outreach week. And as we come, we want to love them. We want to, to bless them. Many come from different faiths. And we want to say, this is why I love you. This is why I'm blessing you. Because there's this God. His name's Jesus. He loved me. He blessed me. This is why we do what we do. God has changed our lives. We get to experience his grace. God is glorified in our lives. And as God is glorified in our lives, we have this opportunity to love and bless others so that they might have the hope that we have. And it wouldn't be about us. We wouldn't walk away from this week thinking, look how amazing we are. We would come away from this week saying, how good is God? Look at what he did in this life and in that life and in that life. There's a number of us within the life of the church involved this week. There's also a number of us who can't because of work and, and different commitments I would just encourage you, if that's you, if you're within that category, if you're busy and not able to attend, just pop in. Just pop in for even half an hour at some point, even for the community meal, even if it's like six o'clock. Just come along and just see what God is doing in our midst. And as you do that, watch how God is working among the many nations within the life of DBC. We're blessed to live in a community that is surrounded by nations and continents of the world. And what's happening as we go into this week, it's almost like a little brochure of heaven, a little foretaste of what God is doing. We sample for us before that big day when we're going to worship Jesus. And when you see that, when you see that this week, when you look ahead to all that God might do, you'll have hope. You'll pray with hope. You'll be someone who is hopeful because you carry that eternal vision of what God is going to do. So this morning we just want to create some space as we now respond in worship. Um, I'm aware of the fact that you've maybe never made Jesus Lord of your life today. You've never made that decision in your life to follow him, to say that he's going to be Lord. He's going to be over every single aspect and detail of my life. And if that's you, then do speak to myself or to TJ or Paul. Uh, we would count it a privilege as leaders within the church to pray for you, that you might come to experience his grace. Or if you know someone who loves the Lord, speak with them and they can pray for you. Perhaps this morning you're going through a trial. Maybe you're just finding it really difficult. You're feeling overwhelmed by what it is you face. Then again, do speak to us. There's no point in turning up and putting on that smiley Christian face and then walking away like you've been baptised in lime juice. But you need to come and you need to connect with us. This is a place where we can be honest and open.
And if you don't do that, you're missing the whole point of church. So do come and connect with us. If you're finding it difficult, speak to us and we'll pray with you and for you. And perhaps you need prayer for healing. We believe in the God who heals. And so we would create space for you to pray for a particular ailment or illness. And when I say that, I'm not saying that God will heal you, but we believe that God does heal and God will use whatever you face to strengthen you in your faith and to enable you to be more faithful and fruitful for him. So these are ways in which we can respond in prayer. We're going to now sing. Um, as we begin this time of worship, let me exhort the words of Paul from Ephesians. These are words that I heard 10 years ago as I was at that conference. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, and it'll be up on the screen, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the mighty working of his strength. Let that be our prayer this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you that, that we have the opportunity now to respond. We pray that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you would be speaking to us, you would be ministering to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to have your way. We don't want to, to direct us, we want you to direct us time. And we pray, Lord, for those moments and times where we've tried to put you in a box, we've tried to control the situation. Lord, we just want freedom today and we pray that you would guide us as we now respond in these various ways and as we carry hope in light of what you have done in light of what you are doing and in anticipation of what you will do we pray that this hope would be something we experience not just today but into the rest of this week in Jesus name Amen Love you guys <laughs>